there's not as many good Canadian movies. Yeah. As say. Like if you said we were going to do Canadian music, Canadian music, uh, we honestly have, there's a lot of good stuff. That came we out do. Of yeah. And I think we both know a lot of really good Canadian music, yeah. but I... Canadian movies, being a, a former Canadian filmmaker, I don't want to shit on it too much, but... <laughs> Like, it's not not as strong as a lot of other countries. Mm -hmm. We produce good comedic actors. Mm -hmm. We produce good actors in general. Yeah. And musicians. But the productions that take place in Canada, not often as not good. as great. Yeah. Like, there's lots of things filmed in Canada. Canada is a very beautiful place to film True, movies. lots of stuff filmed here. And I did think about making that caveat of, like things that were filmed in canada but maybe weren't a canadian well that movie. could be pretty much anything um but then yeah then i the spectrum was too broad we have a lot of good hockey movies oh yeah yeah goon, goon. i think goon is actually a great movie i actually saw goon and i enjoyed it's it it's very funny yeah it was goon funny. Too, i love solid. jay baruchel yeah great canadian actor yeah <laughs> Great com Canadian comedian. Right. Yes. I don't know if he's a great actor. True. He kind of plays Jay Baruchel and everything. It's true. He has a one character. <laughs> kind of. The Rocket was a very good Canadian hockey movie as well. Oh, yeah. It was a biopic of Maurice Richard. We have some good small budget horror. Do we? Yeah. Okay. Not just ones that my friends made, but like Ginger Snaps is a big one. Right. I Wolf forgot about Cop, Ginger Snaps. That kind of stuff. Okay. And then yeah. all of Cronenberg's stuff, the stuff that he did here, because Cronenberg, Cronenberg's kind of my boy. I like him a lot. Is he your boy? A little bit. Uh, yeah, I had a hard time picking a Canadian thing of the week that wasn't Anne of Green Gables, because I feel like that's my like ultimate number one Canadian thing. It's a lot of people's ultimate number one Canadian thing. Yeah, it is. But you know what? We should introduce <laughs> our podcast because it is Canada Week here at I Love This, You Should Too. My name is Indy, my bloody Valentine Randawa, and with me is Samantha Porky's Randawa. No, I don't want to be Porky's. <laughs> meatballs? Who's Meatballs? It was a Canadian movie that starred uh, Bill Murray. Oh. It was nominated for the first ever Gemini Best Picture. Interesting. Genie. Sorry, Genie. Geminis are uh, music, right? What yes. are the Geminis? Yeah. Man, I don't know Canadian stuff. For a couple of Canadians, we're not we're great not at this. We're not good. I feel like... Canadian music, though, we could talk about. Canadian though. music. I was going to say, like, Jan Arden, Sarah McLaughlin. I, like, grew up listening to those. Oh, you like the the big heavy hitters. Yeah. Like, it really gets you in your emotions. <laughs> but, um, yeah, if you wanted me to name, like, seven Canadian movies, I don't think I could. I could do seven. Well, I, seven you good seven. ones? Well, you that's a little harder. literally studied film. <laughs> Not many Canadian ones in my film studies classes. But like I said, it is all Canadian content this week, so we are each going to have a spoiler-free Canadian thing of the fortnight, and then I'll reveal what our big watch is for next week. It's going to be my pick, and it's going to be a Canadian movie. I'm excited, I think. I, I, I'm excited. You do say that every time. I'm always, I guess you're always excited. I'm always excited. So, Indy, since it's your week to announce your Canadian movie, uh, tell us what your Canadian thing of the fortnight is. My Canadian thing of the fortnight is the Canadian reality comedy documentary competition series, oh. Kenny vs. Spenny. Oh, what do you know about the show? I, isn't it just like two guys kicking each other in the balls every episode? You know what? You're not far. And it's just like dumb high school boys enjoyed it. Not to like <laughs> insult you, but that's just like what I know. Yeah, not Kenny to insult you about this thing that you clearly enjoy and you're going to tell me about, <laughs> but only dumb people enjoy no, it. No, <laughs> that's just kind of what I thought, but please enlighten me. Let me. So <laughs> if you're not familiar, Kenny vs. Fanny is a TV show starring uh, Kenneth Hotz, who is Kenny, and Spencer Rice, Spenny, and they face each other in competition every week. And at the end, there is a winner, and the loser has to perform a humiliation. Oh. So they get humiliated on air. Whoa. And it is a reality show, and it is not scripted. And frankly, I don't think they could be faking any of this because they're not that good of actors. 
Oh. <laughs> I've seen them in other things and they can't. This is... This is like all real. It is real. Of course, things are heightened and I'm sure producers push them to do certain things. Mm-hmm. But the emotions in the show, I believe, are all true and real. And that's where this show gets very interesting. So through this, I'll tell you why I think it's a little better than, a lot better than just something dumb people watch and people getting kicked in the balls. Right. Although I'm not saying it's not that. Okay. I'm saying it starts there and goes to some interesting, heartbreaking places at times. Okay. So it ran from 2003 to 2010 and had 86 episodes across, I think, four or five networks because they kept getting canceled and then brought back. Oh. And oddly enough, this show that was so vulgar at times, its first season was on CBC and it was the lead in to the nightly news. Oh, It my was goodness. a 5.30 show. Oh, that's not what I expected. No, because <laughs> it is not good for that. And uh, one of the reasons they say they were canceled on CBC after the first season was because their shows would end with these humiliations, which mm-hmm. would perhaps involve someone getting kicked in the balls. And that would be at the very end. And people tuning in for their news would see that right before right. and call in and complain. Be like, this show is garbage. Yeah. So it has several remakes in different countries. So there's a French Canadian version called Frank versus Girard. There's Ed versus Spencer in England. In Colombia, there's Juan versus Roman. There's Elton versus Simon in Germany, Katya versus Bridget in the Netherlands, and Sid versus Varun in India. Interesting. So some of them were just taking the idea and some were like remade the show. Like So it was kind of... uh, I think those people were acting and they were trying to be Kenny and Spenny oh. and like playing the roles. So this is like an international success. Yeah. Wow. But also not that successful as huh. well. Okay. It's a really, really interesting show in a lot of ways. If we just talked about the production history and what that says about Canadian television, that's all really interesting. But we're not going to get into that because <laughs> that's not interesting to 98% of you. <laughs> So it is silly competitions a lot of the time, but I think what the first thing to elevate it is these two personalities. And they are very different people, but they were very, very good friends in real life to begin. And this show is kind of a document of the crumbling of this friendship and how two people can learn to hate each other. That's so sad. It is. It really is. Oh, no, that's really sad. A lot of the show is very sad. Spenny would play uh, himself off as like the rule follower. I am going to do good on this show. And when there's some like dumb competition like... uh, one time they were strapped together in a, like a 69 position. Oh. And it's the first one who wants out loses. And in that dumb competition, Spenny is like, while we're doing this stupid competition, I'm going to tell you facts about climate change. I'm going to try to educate right. through this TV show. And Kenny just uh, makes fun of him mercilessly and cheats throughout all oh. of these shows. He cheats a lot. And normally... If you're watching a show and one person is trying to do good and change the world in the show Mm -hmm. and the other one is cheating and insulting the other person's mother, you would cheer for the person doing good. Mm -hmm. That's not the case in this show. Really? It might be to start. You might start liking Spenny, but it is very hard to continue watching the show and like Spencer because he is so neurotic and Full of self-righteousness, but a lack of self-awareness hmm. that you grow to hate him. He's such a loser that you like when he loses. Oh. He just keeps on losing, but you're like, yeah, of course you're losing. Look at you, you loser. And then that makes you think about yourself. Huh. Like, why am I cheering for the guy who's cheating all the time? Interesting. He is just, okay, he's just more charismatic, more fun. Right. While the other guy is... Kind of a drag. Such a drag. And like, he really is a loser. Like there's the one episode where they just, the competition is who's cooler. Right. And Spenny goes out and wears these like stupid shiny shirts (laughs) and this terrible bandana and puts on a soul patch because he's like, yeah, I'm a real cool guy. Hey guys, I'm cool. Cool, cool. And 
clearly has no idea or no self-awareness. And then people come in and just like, look at this idiot. (laughs) And he's so stupid in certain ways that you can't help but revel in his humiliation every now and then. Okay. Kenny said after the show that the ultimate joke of the show is that the person that should be loved is the one that's hated and the guy that's playing by the rules is seen as an idiot. Right. And it is. That is the ultimate joke of the show. But throughout this competition and these two very different characters and stupid, stupid things, you get to see some of the most bizarre and compelling reality TV that I've ever seen. Huh. And when Kenny is cheating, and he will cheat, so for instance, there is one episode where it was, I think it might have been, who can produce the most semen? Ew. Yeah, right? Very gross. Ew. So what Kenny did was borrow an x-ray machine and come in at night and irradiate Spenny's testicles. And Spenny doesn't know. And it doesn't even come up in the rest of the show. And then over the credits, I think it was you hear a phone call of Spenny to the producers. Because by this point, he's seen the episode. And him just saying, like, you could kill me. You can give me cancer. And just complaining. And rightfully so. Because that is a terrible thing to do to someone. Yeah. Or, like, affect his future, like, family. Yes. (laughs) And I'm not sure if... The x-ray machine was working or on or any of that, but Spenny believes it was. And so you get to see those real reactions. And I don't believe any of that part is staged at all. And there's normal things, normal, like uh, competitions like who's the better actor and they each do a kind of a one-man show, who is stronger. I think they had one about farting Hmm. and uh, who can survive in the woods the longest First one to use their arms loses was a fun one. (laughs) And then the humiliations, if you lose, are terrible things like having a live rat placed in your underwear. Um, Once they tied, so the crew decided that this is a double humiliation. So then they had to make out with each other. Oh, wow. Kenny once drank coffee that was brewed with Spenny's used underwear as a filter. Ew. Yeah, it's, it's gross. It's very gross. But it's in the truly evil things that are almost the most entertaining. So one episode, I'm going to spoil a few episodes of the show, but you know what? It's uh, very old and it's not who wins or loses. That's the most interesting part. It's how you get there. Right. So there was a figure skating episode (laughs) and Kenny knew he was going to lose. So he fakes a broken leg to get out of it. Because he doesn't want to lose. He just straight up fakes a broken leg. Yeah, and how he does it and the lengths he goes to to do it is amazing. And there's a who's funnier episode. So Kenny's strategy is I need to make this depressed man more depressed so he can't do his stand-up comedy. Oh. So he fakes a letter from the Ontario Health Ministry saying someone that you've had unprotected sex with has HIV. <gasps> And you may as well. And he gives him that. And so then, of course, Spenny goes up and like is crying on stage, essentially. Right. And Kenny's bid for his comedic act was the letter. He gave the judge the letter and said, this is my practical joke on Spencer. And then he wins because of that. (gasps) No! Oh my god, that's so sad. Oh, but it gets it gets worse. Somehow it gets worse sometimes. There was one where it was who can wear a dead octopus on their head the longest? Ew. Again, stupid, makes no sense. Gross. But Kenny's idea was to dose Spanny with LSD. And this makes for one of the best... 20 minutes of TV I'd seen in quite some time. Oh, wow. Because he's tripping out. He's in the yard and just like praying to the rain when it's raining. (sighs) And at one point, Kenny says to him like, what's wrong? Pretending that he doesn't Uh know he's been dosed with LSD. And my favorite line, which I still uh, quote to this day, is he responds with, I was fucking born, man. (laughs) (laughs) See, even you are laughing at him and you haven't seen it. But that's this guy who's constantly belittled and bullied and ridiculed being dosed with LSD. 
shouting about how terrible his life is and you're laughing at it yeah see it mm. gets there and you haven't even seen it yet <laughs> and there are times where it goes too far like some of the things i told you but there's other ones that i won't even mention but it goes too far a lot of the times and i believe it's real and there was one instance where spenny essentially wins a competition because they thought he would kill himself if he got pushed anymore, so they just like gave him one. Oh. He was on the edge of a cliff. Like a literal cliff. A literal cliff. Not figurative. Oh. And this show did in fact kill their friendship. The finale came, I think, a year or two after they had finished shooting. So they did one special to kind of wrap it up. Right. And you can tell they don't like each other. And the last seasons you can tell that as well. Oh, that's sad. And then the show ends and they don't speak for about six years or something. <gasps> And they were like best friends. Oh my God. So in this show, you get to see dumb competitions, Uh gross humiliations, Uh and then true insights into humanity, to victimization, to evil, maybe? I don't know. Just just terrible stuff. And what it does to a friendship. Uh And in recent years, I think in the last... Since the pandemic, they've kind of reconciled and there's talk about maybe rebooting it again. Oh, my God. If I stopped being friends with someone because of something very specific and we did reconcile a little bit, I would not go back to that thing that like ended our relationship. But what if you were a actor and you've been trying for the last 15 years to get something else off the ground and nothing else has? maybe you'd go back yeah i guess i don't have that actor desperation of like yeah. something needs to be a hit and man i think both of them have that desperation oh yikes this so, is so sad we will do this show on this show okay at some point okay because just like you said i don't know it's a show about people getting kicked in the dick it is but it's so much more okay. and i think you would be interested shocked and appalled but you would want to keep watching i think Mm, okay there might be times where you're like no i'm done for today one episode and that that was that was too much Uh but you'd come back so i'm interested Mm -hmm. you've piqued my interest but i don't know how to like get over my like first (laughs) impression of this show will i slowly fall in love with it like dairy girls oh no okay no I don't think you would necessarily fall in love with it. Uh-huh. I think you would be amazed and shocked by what you have seen. Okay. And not just like people doing weird competitions, but the true emotion that is captured here is not something that you see very often. Okay. Like reality TV shows are striving for real, authentic emotion right right yeah they try to manufacture they try to put you on an island to get it Uh they try to lock you in a house or they try to make you do a series of competitions Uh but that's not what gets it what gets it is years of history between these people and these two personalities that are somehow the most compatible and also the antithesis of one another Uh that's what gets them there It's like when you like any reality show, Mm -hmm. if you're someone who used to watch like Intervention because you want to cry Mm -hmm. or anything like that, this gives you the same sort of idea and it's sustained over years. But you get glimpses all the time. Not every episode is all of that going to come out. Some episodes will be fun just because it is legitimately funny. Right. And then sometimes you're going to see something that is very upsetting, not in upsetting that these two guys are belted together in a 69 position right but because you're seeing someone's spirit be broken oh that's sad it is that's really sad somehow you can't look away (gasps) it's a a a remarkable show is what i will say (laughs) okay a truly remarkable show uh you can watch it because kenny just uploaded it onto youtube oh so you can just go watch them all on youtube it's just like there for free yeah okay so uh go check out kenny versus spenny Maybe start off with who can wear a dead octopus on their head for the longest. Because I think it's one of my favorite and it distills a lot of what happens in that show in one episode. Okay. Octopus. <laughs> what do you think about that? Do you have any interest? Um, 
I'm cautiously interested. Because <laughs> you like reality shows, but you tend to like reality shows that are more about look how fancy this person's house is. Yeah. It's not that. They, their house is terrible. <laughs> and they live together. Oh. And they film it all just in their house. Okay. Yeah. I, I figured when you said backyard that they live together. Yeah. But yeah, that's uh, kind of what I was expecting, honestly. <laughs> so go check out Kenny versus Benny. Excellent. How about you, Sam? What is a Canadian thing that you are into this fortnight? We're going to talk about the Holocaust. Okay. <laughs> Just in case I brought you down. Sam's yeah, here to I'm uh, sorry. bring you back up. This isn't a feel good episode. Um, so I read this book, I think, in junior high. Um, it came out in 2002. It's called Hannah's Suitcase by Karen Levine. Um, Karen Levine was a producer with CBC Radio um, and is like national internationally recognized for uh her work in reporting and um producing so she is uh very very well known uh if you really like the radio (laughs) and um hannah's suitcase is a true story that unfolds across um a couple years revealing the tragic events of the holocaust and uh kind of people trying to make sure that people remember the Holocaust. Um, So it kind of has two stories flowing through it. The first one is of Hannah Brady, who is a young Jewish girl who lived in Czechoslovakia during World War II. And um, the second story is uh, about a Holocaust education resource center in Japan named Fumiko, who... um, is just kind of sent this suitcase that was found um, during the Second World War. And it takes her on this kind of journey of um, who Hannah was and when uh, she, like how she lived and um, what ended up happening to her. And it goes to some pretty dark places, but it's like, I remember thinking like, this is super educational in a way that is like accessible to children or to like younger adults and um i remember it kind of stuck with me and um you're taken to auschwitz you're taken to japan uh to tokyo um and uh you're also taken into hannah's childhood before the war and like kind of who she was before the second world war so it's very very touching and um it's very very educational and i really really enjoyed it did you see the movie? I did not. I did not know there was a movie. There is a documentary, which I believe is maybe also a CBC production. Okay, that makes I'm sense. I'm not sure about that, but it is a Canadian production because I remember when it came out. Nice. I did not realize that there was a documentary. Now I'm going to have to go find it and watch it. <laughs> and be very, very sad. Be very, very sad. But I do remember this being like a really good like learning moment for me in junior high and learning about something that is uh, a huge part of world history. I don't want to say favorite in the sense that it makes it sound like this is a good thing, but yeah. do you is this your favorite Holocaust book that you read in school? Because I, I, I assume other countries are like this too. You read multiple novels. Yeah, that... like we read Night by Elie Wiesel. Yep. And um, we went to a talk... Um, at the U of A, um, like our entire class or our entire like year went. Um, and yeah, I think this one is really interesting because it's not presented like a textbook. It's presented like a story and it's a lot more kind of accessible um, to young minds who are like interested in learning about this without feeling like they're reading kind of a social studies textbook or something. I think my favorite was the Lois Lowry Number of the Stars that I read in maybe grade three. It's for a much younger audience. Right. I don't think I ever read that one. It was pretty good. Huh. Well, I haven't read it since grade three, so it right. might not be might as good as I thought. But it's Lois Lowry, so it's probably pretty yeah, solid. Yeah, she was, she was a solid. And then, of course, uh, did you do Dyer Van Frank as well? Yes. Yeah, yeah I did. A a, I wrote that. I think that might have been grade four or grade five for me. I think it might have been for me as well. Yeah. And I did a I remember writing a paper on it. 
and doing a presentation and I was like super into it. It was like really interesting to me. So I think that's probably why I kind of glommed onto this book years later. Um, but yeah, I really enjoy this and I think it's an important thing for people to learn about. Can you tell us the title and author once more? Yeah, it's Hannah's Suitcase by Karen Levine. And if you want to watch the documentary, I believe that's called Inside Hannah's Suitcase. Okay. And it's from somewhere... 2002 is when the book came out. And the movie's after that. Okay, perfect. (laughs) The one sad thing I remember... Well, one sad thing. It's all sad things. But about the production of that movie, they are not using the actual suitcase in the Mm -hmm. movie. They're using a replica because the actual suitcase was destroyed by neo-Nazis in England. Ugh. Just a reminder, because neo-Nazis are stronger now than they have been in many years. So yeah. uh, like this if you is... see a Nazi, uh, kick Call... him in the dick. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Radiate them in their sleep. Yes. <laughs> That's the only time Samantha recommends irradiation for people. So if they're Nazis, then you can irradiate their testicles in their sleep. Yes, and that's how we stop further stop further procreation. Well, I would suggest it's an education system that we need to stop further neo-Nazis right. and uh incentivizing radical right-wing theology as many true. people do. Very true. Especially in our oh, you know what? I'm not going to talk about what's nope. going on here. We no, we are going to move on to this week's big watch. Let's let's go back. Shall we? To the very first Genie Awards. We know that Bill Murray did not win. Right. But what did win? It's 1980. One fun thing from the very first Genies is that there was an award for Best Film Editing, and there's three uh, nominees. And then the presenter came on and said, we do not deem any of these worthy of an award. Oh, my God. What a fuck you, huh? Wow. Why do you even nominate? Why do you even have the category? Why do you, yeah, if there isn't anything good, you can just not announce the category. Yeah, you're just calling them out for being bad. Yeah, you're just saying like, you guys suck. Yeah. And we want you to have national ridicule. But the nominees for Best Picture were the aforementioned Meatballs. Uh-huh. I like how Meatballs was nominated for the first genie. That's funny to me. <laughs> but the winning film and the film that won the most awards, including... Best Foreign Actor, Uh Best Foreign Actress, Uh because they used to have uh, separate categories for Canadian Actor and Foreign Actor. Right. I think Plummer won Best Actor, but that doesn't matter. The winner for Best Foreign Actor, Foreign Actress, Adapted Screenplay, Art Design, Cinematography, Sound, and Sound Editing was the 1980 horror. Oh. The Changeling. Okay. Starring George C. Scott and directed by Peter Medak. Okay. So the movie is actually set in Seattle, I now realize. I didn't realize that before. So it's a shame to pick something that was filmed in Canada but meant to be American. Right. But 1980, not a lot of movies were trying to show that they were Canadian. Everything was trying to hide how Canadian it was. Right. And a lot of movies still do that. But this was still uh, not just shot in Canada, but it was a Canadian production. So that's why it still counts as a Canadian movie to me and for the genies as well. Okay. So this was a relatively low-budget movie, and they raised funding by selling shares. Oh. They just sold shares for, I think it was like 25 grand or something. And if the movie does well, you will get money back on that because okay. it didn't have a big company behind it. Chessman Park Productions. You know that powerhouse? No. <laughs> exactly. Distributed by Pan Canadian Film Distributors. Huh. So it had a budget <laughs> of $6 million and made $12 million, So people got their money back. And then okay. Okay. And this is a horror movie, again, starring George C. Scott, like I said. And it follows a composer who relocates and he moves into a mansion that he believes is haunted. (gasps) And I picked this movie because I think this was my first favorite horror movie. Oh, okay. I saw it, like all horror movies, way too young. I was probably, I don't know, seven or eight. (laughs) And this movie was very common for whatever reason. I think because of its distribution. Right now, actually, you can watch it on YouTube. Oh. So I'll put the link 
It's very available. Because it's not available in other forms. I think there was a Blu-ray release. I do own it on DVD because I, I love this movie. Mm-hmm. But I also haven't seen it in many, many years. Okay. And when I saw it at that age, it was the first time where I thought, I like horror movies. This oh. this is fun. I like what this is doing. It scared me and I kind of liked it. And that right. was the first time that it happened. Before you see something like an instance of something scary in some other movie and you like turn away and it scares you and you just move on. Right. This was my awakening maybe to horror movies. Mm. Uh, soon after I watched Night of the Living Dead was probably the big one that got me as well. Mm-hmm. And Return of the Living Dead when I got into horror comedy all again way too young (laughs) all under the age of 10 baby indy but the changeling was the first one that i said that's my favorite scary movie (gasps) it was my first favorite scary movie i think i've only watched it once after the age of like 15 Uh and i still liked it okay i'll have to check and get back to you on whether or not i still love it after (laughs) we watch it okay So I'm just going to say, go watch it. It's available for free on YouTube. We'll put a link in the show notes. Mm -hmm. It's not terribly long, so you can get through it. Go do that. Excellent. I am going to give one caveat. And I don't like to uh, say like, ah, it's not that good and like kind of uh, couch people's expectations. Right. But it is a 1980s low budget horror movie. Okay. So effect wise, might not be great. Uh Uh-huh. So rather than... Having the mindset of like, oh, that doesn't look as scary as movies now because now we have CG and this is just a ball rolling downstairs. Right. Appreciate what they're doing with how little they have. Okay. Just go into with that mindset and try not to get taken out by things that don't look entirely real because you know what? That's how (laughs) this movie is. Okay. But it did pioneer quite a few things that you probably have seen in horror movies in the last few years done much better. But a lot of them came from this one. Okay. So go check out The Changeling from 1980 starring George C. Scott, not the Angelina Jolie movie called (laughs) Changeling. And I think there's another movie called The Changeling as well. But we're doing this one, and I'll put a link into the show notes. Awesome. Sam, any thoughts on watching another spooky movie? I'm excited. It's not even Spooktober. It's not even Spooktober, and I'm getting a Spooktober movie. Mm -hmm. I'm excited, as usual. As usual. (laughs) As always, very excited. Well, join us again next week when we both decide if we loved the changeling does it hold up to my (laughs) eight-year-old expectations Uh only time will tell oh you get to do that in whatever month it is now it's june okay cool (laughs) see you next week bye everybody Ooh.